Ladies and gentlemen, let's get into this video. Let's talk about Imbibiter Lune and do a bit of a guide video for this man himself. But before we jump right into it and talking about this quite intricate but obvious kit, I want to preface that this is being recorded well, well, well before the release of the character, as I won't be here roughly during his release. And so I'm covering this very early. So a lot of the stuff might change, a lot of the percentages might change, but the rough gameplay should be roughly the same because we've actually gotten a gameplay of Imbiber to Lune in the game through the new story. So I just wanted to clarify that really quickly, that some things might be wrong with the final product, but generally speaking, the overall gameplay should be the same. So starting off with Mr. Imbiber to Lune, he's a destruction imaginary character. So he's a generic DPS with the destruction tag, and he does imaginary damage, which is extremely powerful as we are getting an imaginary DPS, which are going to be very, very useful. Now, we have to go down to his basic attack and skill. Now, we're going to actually forget about the basic attack for the time being, and we're going to go straight to his skill because his skill is a rather unique one. So his skill is classified as an enhancement skill, which that's pretty much what it does. It enhances him a few times. So reading it, enhances basic attack. The enhancers may be applied up to three total times consecutively. Using this ability does not consume skill points and is not considered as using a skill. That's a very interesting thing because the skill points are consumed essentially through the actual auto attack itself. Now let's go into talking about those enhanced basic attacks one by one. So pressing his skill just one time uh, will enhance his basic attack Beneficent Lotus and transforms it into Transcendence. Now what does Transcendence do? Well Transcendence unleashes a three hit combo in this attack and deals imaginary damage equal to 260% of Dan Heng in Bible Lune's attack to a single enemy target. That's just the level one enhancement. Pressing your skill one more time, enhancing the basic attack to a total of two times, transforms it into Divine Spear. Now, Divine Spear unleashes a five hit attack, dealing imaginary damage equal to 380% of Dan Heng in Bible Lune's attack to a single target. And then from the fourth hit onwards, simultaneously deal damage, uh, imaginary damage equal to 60% of Dan Heng and Bible Lune's attack to adjacent targets. Now you may think that that's essentially a AoE attack. It's kind of a 50-50. It does have that caveat there of from the fourth attack onwards because it's a five hit combo. Hits four and five are the only hits that are actually AoE. The other ones are just pure single target on that primary uh, enemy. And then again, going back to the skill, enhancing his basic attack, pressing that button one more time, enhances Beneficent Lotus into Fulgurant Leap, which is the final enhancement for his basic attack. And what Fulgurant Leap does is it unleashes a seven hit attack, dealing imaginary damage equal to 500% of Dan Heng in Bible to Lune's attack to a single target. And then again, from that fourth hit onwards, simultaneously deal damage equal to 180 of his uh, Imbibital Lune's attack to adjacent targets, which is very, very powerful. And it's also, again, remember, got that fourth hit onward effect. So essentially hits four, five, six, and seven are going to be the AoE ones, whilst hits one, two, and three are going to be pure single target, which is very, very powerful. And as you can imagine, this is going to be incredibly good next patch. But then... Again, coming back to that skill, we've got a bit more to read here. When unleashing the Divine Spear or the Fulgurant Leap, which is Enhancement Level 2 or Enhancement Level 3, one stack of Dominating Raw is gained for every hit, starting from the fourth hit. So again, you, you're going to want to use Enhancement Level 3 to get the maximum effect for this, because each stack of Dominating Raw increases Imbibiter Lune's crit damage by 12% for a maximum of four stacks. These stacks last until the end of this turn. That's a lot to take in, but essentially for every hit after the fourth hit, um, start well, starting from the fourth hit, I should say, of his Divine Spear Enhancement Level 2 or Fulgurant Leap Enhancement Level 3, you're going to get a crit damage bonus practically just for that attack. You're not going to be getting this for the next turn, it's just for this turn. So you're probably going to be wanting to use his uh, Fulgurant Leap to get the most you can, but still, that's a very, very powerful skill. And that is the core of Imbibita Lune's gameplay, is, is the rotation and usage of your skill points, or rather, you don't even use skill points with the skill, but just getting up to that level 3 attack and just dealing damage. But quickly, before we get on to the ultimate, I want to cover the talent Righteous Heart. Uh, Imbibita Lune gains one stack of Righteous Heart after each hit unleashed during an attack. Righteous Heart increases damage dealt by 10% up to 6 stacks, last until the end of his turn. Simply put, if you use Fulgurant Leap, 
Uh, the first six hits will gain you one stack each, increasing in damage subsequently. And then that last hit will have a total of 60% damage increase on it. And then once your turn ends, you lose the effect. Although you lose the effect, still extremely powerful just for using one of your abilities. And then jumping onto his ultimate, Cleansing of the World, unleash a three hit attack, dealing imaginary damage equal to 300% of Imbibed Lune's attack to a single enemy and imaginary damage of 140 uh, attack to adjacent targets and also obtain two Squama Sacrosancta. A maximum of three of these Squama Sacrosanctas can be possessed at any given time and Imbibed Lune may consume an equivalent number of these Sacrosancta stacks instead of skill points. Consuming these Sacrosancta stacks is considered equivalent to consuming skill points, which is a very, very cool ability and a cool concept that the character himself can give himself pseudo skill points to consume because he's going to be a high skill point consumption character as pressing his skill does not consume the skill points, but when you do launch the attack, you do in fact consume the skill points. So having your ultimate there provide you with two free skill points uh, just on using it is a uh, very, very useful. But bear, bear in mind, they're not actual skill points. These are skill points that only Darn Heng in Bible Lune will be able to utilize because they are specific to he himself. So be wary of that part. But then again, I also should, should clarify, his ultimate is not going to be his core damaging ability because we have to remember that the third enhancement ability from his skill does much more damage than his ultimate. So the ultimate is going to be mainly used for these Squama Sacrosancta stacks, so you can very easily go into using his tier 3 skill. The next thing we got is the technique. Now, the technique is rather simple. Use his technique, he enters the Leaping Dragon state. Uh, while in this state, using his attack causes him to move forward for a set distance, attacking all enemies he touches and blocking all incoming attacks. That's a new mechanic, by the way. The blocking of attacks is a new mechanic that is being added with both Imbibed Lune and Fu Shuan. And then after entering combat via this dragon state, Dan Heng in Bible Lune deals a 120 of his attack to all enemies and gains one Squama Sancro Sancta stack, which is also very, very useful. And you can think of a combo of using his technique, entering combat, using his ultimate, and then using his tier three auto attack just for free, which is actually kind of crazy. And the last three things to look at before we just judge his base round kit is his bonus abilities through the trace menu. Now, the first one here, Stirring Dragon Unveiled Legend. We've got this character's crit rate is increased by 12% when dealing damage to enemy targets with imaginary weaknesses. This is quite the crazy ability uh, because uh, it's, it just is a lot of characters and a lot of enemies rather are weak to imaginary. And so you can imagine the potential here. Specifically, if you think about comboing this character with something like a Silverwolf, you'll be able to do absolutely crazy things and always have a perpetual 12% crit rate increase for the character, which is crazy. The second bonus ability, Raining in the Flood, increase the chance to resist crowd control uh, debuffs by 35%. Um, just a flat increase of your chance to resist debuffs. I'm not sure how it's going to work alongside the effect resistance kind of stat, but regardless, it's just an extra chance to resist crowd control debuffs. And then the last one, Concealed Star, at the start of the battle, immediately regenerate uh, 15 energy. Really good, you just have extra 15 energy at the start of the fight. Very good. Very powerful, but that is Darn Heng and Bible Lune's base round kit, and it's like it, like this is un unparalleled power. Uh, he's probably going to be the strongest unit, the strongest single unit in the game once he launches, as it's an imaginary DPS, uh, destruction, AOE, uh, all round very powerful and very uh, utilitarian with his own utilitarian. I don't know if that's even the right word, but very kind of like a synergistic with his whole Sancro Sancta stacks through his ultimate, uh, using those for his skill. And then his bonus ability is working very synergistically uh, with just him. So overall, a uh, baseline, this character is unmatched. Now, characters get better with Eidolons, and uh, Mr. Darnheng is no exception. This man is unparalleled with Eidolons, so going to the first one, Tether the Sky, increase the number of stackable Righteous Heart stacks by four, and one extra stack of Righteous Heart will be gained for each hit per stack. Uh, with that, you can get to a, up to a total of a 100% damage increase uh, just by hitting the enemies with more hits through your auto attack that's been enhanced. Now, if you think about it, your third enhanced basic attack hits for seven, you get one extra stack. That last hit's going to be hidden for an absolute truck amount of damage. So overall, very powerful. It's essentially a 40% damage increase uh, 
Eidolon 1. Very good. Going further onto Eidolon 2, Banners of Domin Dom Dominion, my apologies. Uh, after using Darnhang's ultimate, uh, his action is advanced forward by 100% and gains one extra Squama Sancro Sancta stack, which uh, also, again, uh, very powerful Eidolon. Uh, you essentially turn refresh yourself as well as you give yourself a free... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you give yourself a free elemental skill enhancement three usage, which is crazy. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing because this is actually an inc incredibly powerful character. Uh, just reading this stuff, it's it's kind of unparalleled power that we are getting just with this one character. So very powerful there. Uh, his uh, E3 is just skill and basic attack level up which is very good. And then E4, Outbound Dragon Ling. Uh, buffs provided by Dominating Raw persist until the end of this character's next turn. So essentially making that 100% damage increase that we can get through E1, it persists for an extra turn, meaning uh, the next skill that you use uh, of Enhancement Level 3 will have the full 100% effect applied at the start instead of at the end which is also ridiculously powerful, but again, not as powerful as the previous ones. Uh, E5, Lofty Hubris, Ultimate plus two, as well as Talent plus two, very good. And then the last Eidolon, the Divine Dragon returns after any other ally uses their ultimate. The imaginary resistance penetration of Imbiber Lune's next Fulgurant Leap attack increases by 20 up to three stacks. I don't think there's anything that can really rival that in power as it's not even a raw attack increase it's a resistance decrease uh, that stacks up to three times which is to a total of 60 percent imaginary resistance penetration i should say not resistance rating but penetration uh which is ridiculously powerful this character's eidolons are absolutely bazoinged uh, you can't really get much better than this in terms... The, the only better thing that you could get is 100% crit rate and 100% crit damage increase. But even that's un, like almost just un, uh, like slightly better than C6. It's, it's crazy. I'm kind of like at, at a loss for words of how powerful these Eidolons are. But again, we've got to give a good value on the, um, the kind of like where you're trying to invest in and what's like the best value. Simply put, his best value is E6. Uh, e you're not going to get much better than that. But if you're looking for a small bit of investment in this character, E1 is probably going to be uh, the stopping point. You get a large damage increase there, and it, it's overall just a, a very good thing. E2 is if you'll really want that kind of the gameplay to be perfect, as you'll have that turn refreshing and the extra Squama Sancro Sancta stack. Sancro Sancta. Jesus Christ, that's a hard word to say. Uh, you'll have that extra stack that you get a free ability, so it's going to be overall uh, very synergistic. But if you're just looking for a damaging character, E1, uh, E2 for that extra bit of gameplay fluidity. Going further than this, you lose a bit of value as his E4 is not overly necessary. It's just going to be there for the higher echelon of kind of consistency because his next skill will deal like incredibly large amounts of damage. So uh, I wouldn't recommend going to E4 if you're just looking for minimal, minimal investment. Uh, as an Eidolon uh, getter, but yeah, that's going to be my recommendation. E1 for damage, E2 for that extra bit of fluidity, E6 if you're a whale and you kind of don't want to replace your DPS for the next, like, I don't know, two years. Now, it's an absolute no-brainer that his signature, Brighter Than The Sun Light Cone, is going to be his best in slot. What it does is increase his crit rate by 18 at the Superimposition 1, and then when the wearer uses their basic attack, they get a stack of Dragon Call for two turns. Each stack of Dragon Call increases your attack by 12%, and energy regen rate by 7. Up to two stacks can be held of Dragon's Call at any one time, which is, as you can imagine, going to be his best in slot. You get everything that you need uh, for how he plays, which is basic attack and he uh, to a total of 24% attack uh, increase you can get, as well as a 14% energy regeneration rate through this. And obviously that flat, flat, flat 18% crit rate is unparalleled in terms of utility and usefulness. So this is going to be his best in slot by a large margin. So we're not even going to continue talking about it. But as substitutes, the other two five stars, or, you know, other two good five stars, can also be used just fine. Now, Blades released, and we can use Blades absolutely. You may be wondering, why? How? What do you mean? Well, it has that flat 18% crit rate, which is unparalleled. It's, it's you know, any uh, light cone that gives you a flat crit rate or crit damage boost is one of the best in the business. You know, uh, Jing Yuan's, Blades, uh, Mr. Inviber Lunes, they're all going to be top tier things. Now, the only part that you're missing out from with this light cone is that max HP increase. It doesn't provide anything for Inviber Lunate. 
that's the only part that doesn't matter. The last part you can get the effects of, which is when you take damage, you get a 24% damage increase on your next attack. It's very good, you can get this effect. It's gonna be a bit inconsistent because you're gonna need Imbiber to Lunate to take damage. And there's no real good ways for him to take damage if you're running a good composition. So you may not get this effect consistently, uh, consistently, but you can still get the effect. And so this light cone does work. And the other one that works is also on the fall of an Aeon. Now this one, obviously it's free to play. You can get this one to R5 or Superposition 5 uh, for free. Uh, no investment needed. So this one works just fine. And I want to clarify that potentially on the fall of an Aeon might eclipse the other two purely because you can get it to uh, Superposition 5 uh, for completely free investment. So uh, at, at Imposition 1, it's not going to be better as it's just lower percentages. But at Imposition 5, where it gives you 16% uh, percent attack increase, stacking up to four times throughout the whole fight to a total of 64%, uh, you may be able to e eclipse the other two. But do remember that crit rate given through the other two uh, is going to be a lot better. So it all depends on what you need. If you, can get, if you need the crit rate, go for that one. If you don't have them, then go for On the Fall of an Aeon. It'll be just fine. Now, you may be wondering what about something irreplaceable. I just wouldn't recommend it. It does the kind of the same thing, but it's just based on getting hit and uh, healing. And so I wouldn't recommend uh, something irreplaceable just because it also doesn't have that crit rate increase that the Unreachable side has because they're kind of the same, but Unreachable side has that flat crit rate increase, which is a much better. Now, as for the four stars, because let's say you, you, you know, lose the RNG pool and you don't get the signature, what about the four stars? Well, there's two that don't work, and those two are the Secret Vow and a Wolf Walk Time. I'm not going to recommend those two. Those two, I just, I will put them aside and say these are just very specific and not good for the situation. A Secret Vow requires lower HP. Dan Heng in Bible Lune doesn't need low HP, so that doesn't work. And a Wolf Walk Time is generally just not good. The other three, though, the Mull's Welcome You, Under the Blue Sky, and Nowhere to Run, they'll just be fine. They increase your damage through some sort of natural way and some sort of very easy method. The Mull's Welcome You is a stacking buff after using uh, different skills. Uh, nowhere to Run is just a flat increase, and so is Under the Blue Sky. So they'll work just fine. And that's practically the light cones. It's very simple, very straightforward, uh, but just don't use a Secret Vow, a Wolf Orc Time, and something irreplaceable. At least, uh, unless you really want to. As for relic sets and planar ornaments, it's a very simple one. Musketeer of Wild Wheat and Wastelander of Banditry are your two best in slots. Uh, Musketeer of Wild Wheat just because of that basic attack increase as well as more attack and more speed. So simply, it's just going to be a mad uh, stat increase uh, that doesn't play to any kind of strong suit except for that basic attack. As for Wasteland of Banditry, it's imaginary and also crit rate increase and crit damage increase on imprisoned enemies. So overall, uh, it's play playing to his element. Now, my recommendation is going to go for Wastelander just because it's imaginary. You get a lot more crit rate uh, and crit damage increase, which is just going to be universally a little bit more useful than the speed and basic attack damage increase. As for planar ornaments, my full re recommendation is going for Rutilant Arena. I, don't, I wouldn't try to go for like the other ones like Inert Cell Soto, Space Ceiling, or Celestial. I wouldn't recommend those. Go for it, Ritual and Arena, as its crit rate increased by 8%, with a 70% requirement to get the basic attack and skill damage increased by 20%. Now, usually, I would add the caveat that you're not actually going to get that skill damage increased by 20%, and that's like kind of a bad thing. But in this case, um, it's not really because you need that basic attack damage increase. Skill damage is not going to do anything, but that basic attack damage by 20% is really, really unparalleled for the character. So... Go for Wastelander of Banditry, uh, D Banditry Desert, and Rutilant Arena as my recommendation, but Musketeer of Wild Wheat and the other planar ornaments that I mentioned will work just fine if you have uh, nothing else, really. And finally, talking about quick team composition and closing thoughts on the character. For team composition, you're most likely going to be running him with a uh, just an just imaginary team or an imaginary quantum hybrid. If you have Silverwolf, I highly recommend getting him by Lune, as obviously he is extremely powerful against imaginary weak enemies, as he has a few bonuses, and if you go for the uh, the Wastelander set, then you get more bonuses from just having imaginary weakness, or the potential to a weakness a break with imaginary uh, for Imbibitor. So, if you have a Silver Wolf, I'd recommend uh, Imbibitor Lune, but he's got a lot of good characters that you can synergize with him, I'd recommend... Uh, as well, something like the Yukong, so going for Imbibitor, Yukong, and then Welt if you have him. But again, these are like five-star characters. If you don't have exactly five-star characters to do this with, 
then you can just kind of go for the generic supports like Team Yun or Paler for the defense decrease, or Aster for the attack increase. Very simple. He's just a DPS. You kind of want to just buff him. It's not overly complex, but I do think he's one of his highest performing teams is going to be a kind of uh, imaginary quantum hybrid uh, between two imaginaries and two quantums or three imaginary, one quantum. And something along those lines. He's a great character, by the way. I, I don't know if I've maybe said that or expressed that throughout this whole video, but uh, kind of a fucking phenomenal character. You're not really going to be getting much better than him, at, at least for his specific role and element, right? You're not getting much better than him. So simply put, if you want this character, try your hardest to get him. He's going to be an unparalleled unit for a very long time because of his element. And, and simply put, that's all I'm going to say about him. Hope you guys enjoyed, and hopefully this wasn't too uh, rushed of a guide. I am kind of recording this uh, uh, very much before I have to depart. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed. If it was helpful, like, sub, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.